in a dramatic shift, Wall Street real estate investors are no longer buying homes in the US housing market with new data from Redfin showing a massive 45% contraction in investor purchases over the last year. That's the biggest decline since 2008, particularly in cities like Charlotte, where the purchases are down 60% year over year, Atlanta, where they're down 64%, and Las Vegas, where they're down by a massive 65% and are now basically lower than they were back in 2017. And ultimately, this is good news for you guys out there as regular home buyers. It means you're facing less competition from big Wall Street investors because it simply doesn't make sense for investors to buy real estate in the 2023 housing market due to a combination of rising interest rates, increasing rental vacancies, as well as declining rents in certain markets. With new data from apartment lists showing that rent is now down 1.2% year over year in America, with 72 of the 100 largest cities experiencing a rent decline over the last year, with the biggest being in Oakland, California. And I think those declines in rents might be what the averages are, but if you were to actually go on Zillow and look in your market, you're seeing lots of investors really, really struggle right now. For instance, in my backyard here in Nashville, if you were to go south of the city and look at all the houses and townhomes available for rent, you would see that there's thousands and thousands of them, folks. And if you zoom in on certain neighborhoods, it looks like a third of the neighborhood is on the market for rent. You can see a lot of these landlords like Progress Residential, who's a big Wall Street landlord, they play all these games with the rental rates. Like they'll jack the rent up by 40 40% and cut it by 30% then increase it by 1% and then increase it by 0.2% and then cut it some more. Despite all those gymnastics, the reality is that this house has just been sitting vacant for the last three or four months. And it's interesting to think about how long some of these houses can sit vacant for before these investors start to do major, major rent cuts, right? Not just a couple percent here and there, but 300, 400, $500 on rent to get it to a level that's more affordable for the average renter in America because we're dealing with a, a renter affordability crisis right now. And most renters, they simply can't afford crazy, crazy rent. So I suspect a lot of these Wall Street landlords, they see the writing on the wall as far as the rental market. They're seeing their houses sit vacant. So thus, they're not buying as many houses as a result. But really, there's a whole other problem also going on here, folks, that you need to pay attention to. And that's what's going on with interest in mortgage rates. As many of you know, if you're a home buyer, the interest in mortgage rates have surged over the last year. Right now, the 30-year fixed mortgage is hovering near 7%. And the problem for these Wall Street landlords is that the mortgage rates, the yellow line, have surged. Their cost of debt is way higher. How much they need to pay their lenders has gone up. While the blue line, the cap rate or the income yield from the properties has continued to kind of trend down and stay flat. So today in America, the average investor who's buying, they're only getting a 4.6% return. The income of the property divided by the purchase price is only 4.6%, way below the cost of debt which means anyone buying with debt is losing money. And given that most Wall Street investors buy with debt, that's a big problem. Now you can see this situation is very new. If we go back basically before 2022, we can see that the income of the property always exceeded the cost of debt, which is the way it should be. That would be an incentive to buy real estate. If you could get a 5% cap rate while the mortgage rate is 3%, well, obviously investors are gonna buy. That's what they did during the pandemic, but we're in a completely different ball game right now, everyone, with where rates are and how low incomes and yields are. And so the only real way that we're going to see investors return to the market is if those cap rates go up significantly. If an investor can, once again, get a 6 or 7% return buying real estate, they'll probably come back in. But the problem there is that there's only two ways for cap rates to go up. Either rent goes up or prices go down. And right now we know rent isn't going up anymore. So that leaves Home price declines is the only real way to return yield and profit into the housing market for investors. But first, let's talk about what the investor crash in buying means for home prices into the future. Because if we go back to the last crash, you can see the investor purchases peaked in late 2005. Third quarter 2005, according to Redfin, is when the investor purchases peaked last time, and then the investor purchases collapsed, much like they're doing today. But what you got to understand is that prices in the last downturn, they didn't start collapsing until 2008. So in the last crash, the investors bailed 
three years before we saw major, major declines in home prices. And so that tells you kind of where we're at in this housing cycle right now, everyone. We're one to one and a half years into the downturn. We've started to see prices go down in about half of America, but prices are still very high overall. And ultimately this type of timeline tracks how things work in previous housing downturns because before we're gonna see like major, major declines, like maybe like 20, 30% cuts on houses like that, we're gonna need to see not only investors stop buying, but investors start selling. And that's something we haven't yet seen in this housing downturn. Only 8% of the listings earlier in 2023 on the market for sale came from an investor, while investors own 20% of the homes in America. So clearly the investors have not yet started to sell. Because you gotta understand everyone, the investors and the homeowners in America, they're very stubborn. Like on this listing behind me here, in Nashville, an investor bought this property for $950,000 earlier in 2023, and they immediately proceeded to relist it for 1.4 million while doing no major renovations. And since then they've cut the price to 1.25 million, but this just goes to show how stubborn some investors are. Even though the housing downturn has started, even though rents are now going down, vacancy rates are going up, investors like this are still thinking they can make a quick buck by flipping a house and doing nothing to it. But ultimately the problem for an investor like this is that the house is sitting empty, they're having to pay the property tax bills, the insurance bills, maybe mortgage interest if there's a mortgage on the property, trying to sell that house for a ridiculous price in a zip code where the inventory for sale is up 50% year over year. The inventory here has exploded in the zip code according to Reventrap. The days on the market has exploded. Houses are sitting for a really long time. We have lots of price cuts. So ultimately you gotta ask, how long is that investor gonna be able to you know, pay the property tax bills, the insurance, the mortgage interest, if there is a mortgage, before they say, okay, let's cut the price to a level that's more realistic given the trends in inventory and days on the market. And ultimately one thing that scares me for the US housing market is just how many investors actually own a house today in America. It's a lot. According to the US Census Bureau, around 20 million houses in America are investor owned. According to CoreLogic, it's closer to 27 million. So that's anywhere between one quarter and one fifth of all homes in America are owned by an investor. And that's something that's very new. That has not historically been the case in the US housing market. For instance, if we go back to data from Redfin looking at the share of in homes purchased by investors, we can see it's been elevated you know, up to 20% during the pandemic, it's going down today. But if we actually go all the way back to like 03, 04, 05 in the lead up to the last bubble, it was only eight to 9% of homes being purchased by an investor. But now over the last like five years, we've been north of 14, 15, 16, even 20%. And so this is uncharted territory, everyone. We do not know how the housing market is going to react in a recessionary environment to so many investors owning homes. We have no historical information to really know how that's gonna turn out. And to me, my gut instinct is saying, well, the more people who own who are investors, that means the more people who own who don't live in the home uh, and the more people who own the house purely as a speculative asset. And so if something were to happen in the economy or the rental market or the housing market that was really bad, well then you have millions and millions of owners, 20 to 27 million, who can much more easily just say, okay, I'll sell than someone who's living in the house and it's their place to live. Something that you need to think about here in understanding this investor situation is that almost half of all the investor purchases are by small mom and pop investors. That's right, everyone. Everyone thinks it's the big Wall Street investors who caused the big bubble. No, they were only buying between 10 to 15% of the investor homes, you know, companies, again, like Invitation Homes, American Homes for Rent, Progress Residential, uh, mega investors with over a thousand homes. They've actually cut back big time on their purchases while it's the small investor who owns three to nine houses that accounts for 50%. And I think the thing to think about with these small investors is that if you own three to nine properties, whether it's long-term rentals or Airbnbs, it's very likely that you still have a day job. It's very likely that you still have whatever probably six figure salary job that you're doing in finance or tech and that you're just starting to make enough cash flow from your inv investment properties to maybe do it full time. And so I say to myself, what would happen in the US housing market and to these small investors, if some of them lost their jobs in a recession, like say the unemployment rate, which is now starting to go up, according to CNBC, say that unemployment rate 
went from 3.8% to 6.5%. And we were to see millions of people get laid off, uh, potentially in higher income jobs because of, say, AI, causing a lot of joblessness and layoffs in higher income jobs. What would that do to the small investors that own anywhere between 10 to 15 million homes in America? But I know a lot of you guys are like getting bored of hearing this or getting frustrated and hearing about this, you know, prospective investor sell off and how the value should decline into the future. Because, you know, I've been predicting a housing downturn on my channel for two and a half years. I've predicted a lot of stuff that has happened. Other things haven't happened yet. And the ultimate thing I want you guys to understand, if you're a home buyer who's been waiting for a long time, is that the slow nature of this housing downturn is very normal. Housing downturns don't happen fast. Back in the mid 2000s, the investor buying, it peaked in late 2005. It took another three years for prices to really collapse. Back in the early 90s, in metros like Los Angeles and Boston and Hartford, the housing downturn started around 1990, 1991. It lasted until 1996. And the reason for the slower nature of housing downturns, why prices take years and years to go down, is due to something called the wealth effect. And let me explain the wealth effect to you guys. The wealth effect is that when someone owns a house, whether they're a primary owner or investor, and then they see the value of you know one of the houses behind me, say, go up to 1.5 million, they think that that is then the value they have in the bank. Like they've already decided, okay, that's the value. And so if you reduce that value, you tell them it's worth less than that, they're gonna resist. They're gonna be like, no, no, it's not. Because they've adapted their lifestyle to the assumption that that is what their house is worth. They might've increased their spending. They might've increased their borrowing because of that. Maybe they took out a home equity line of credit on their house because of the increased value. And so it takes time for these people to accept that their house is not worth that anymore. It's actually worth 1.1, 1 million instead of 1.5, or maybe it's worth 350,000 instead of 500,000. And to get there and to get from point A to point B, it's gonna take them years to get there. They're not gonna get there in a couple months. And again, remember folks, the investor decline in buying, that's a prelude historically to declines in prices. You know, especially folks on a listing like this right behind me. You can see that this house, it's actually uh, vacant right now, folks. Like you can tell they haven't mowed the lawn in a long time. You can see the for sale sign right there. And they're pricing this vacant home for, get this, one point. $5 million. That's even more than the $1.2 million home we looked at just up the street. They want even more money. That's crazy. But when I saw this listing, it got me thinking about all the vacant homes on the U.S. housing market and all the shadow inventory on the U.S. housing market. Right now, there's anywhere from 12 to 14 million vacant single family homes in America. That's right, everyone. 15% almost of the housing stock in America is vacant. Uh, a lot of it's vacant on a seasonal basis. So you have people who buy homes and then maybe only live in them for a couple months out of the year, their second or third homes. There's some people who just, you know, buy houses and don't even live in them. They just like to buy houses and let them sit vacant and pay all the expenses. But again, the issue with the vacant homes, right, is that it's something that uh, can exist in a good economy, right? If people have a lot of money, the government prints money, they uh, do artificially low interest rates, like, yeah, it's a great idea to buy a second or third home. Who cares? if I have a couple properties sit vacant, the money's coming in. But then you gotta ask yourself, what happens in a recession? Uh, are they gonna look to unlock the equity in their vacant houses and turn it into cash? And the answer is actually probably most won't. Most are probably just gonna keep the house vacant. They probably have enough money not to sweat it. But if only a couple million of those people end up having issues, you can see a lot of inventory on the US housing market. And that's the overall point, everyone. Uh, the inventory situation can change very, very quickly. Because for instance, in this zip code, according to data on Reventure app, about one and a half percent of the houses that exist in the zip code are listed for sale. And that's a slightly normal to above average inventory level in this market. But if that were to go to two and a half percent of homes being listed for sale, that's a huge surge in inventory on par with the 2008 downturn. And you have pandemonium and prices going down 30%. So that's all that's needed, everyone, going from one and a half percent of homes listed for sale to two and a half percent of homes listed for sale. Now, going back to that last crash, everyone, that happened in 08, 09, 2010, 2011, actually created some of the best buying opportunities of all time for both real estate investors and home buyers. We saw prices go down as much as 50%, 50% in a metro like Phoenix, and that meant that the yields and cap rates were absolutely insane after that last downturn. For instance, if we go on Reventure app and look at cap rate data by zip code in a metro like Phoenix, you can see that in an area like Peoria, the cap rate for investors back in 2011 was 13.6%. 
If you were an investor, you could buy a house for $91,000 and get net rental income of $12,000 right away. I mean, this was an amazing time to buy. Fast forward to today, the cap rate in the zip code is only 6.1%. So not nearly as much of an incentive to buy now as there was back after the last crash. If we zoom on over to an area like Scottsdale, you can see a similar situation. The cap rates are only 4.8% today, but they were 9.3% back in 2011. So you could see actually why a lot of these corporate Wall Street investors got into the market back in 2011, 2012. Like this is when Blackstone started buying because the yields were insane. Now the yields aren't so good. The prices today, they've started dropping, but they really need to do another big drop like they did back then before the yields and cap rates go up and the investors return to the market. And one thing I would recommend a lot of you do out there, if you're a home buyer and investor who wants more insight on the market and you want a better understanding of where home prices are gonna go in the future, go to ReVenture app, www.reventure.app, where you can access the data I've shown you in this video, particularly information on cap rates, inventory levels, price cuts, and how over undervalued home prices are in your market. And for now, this data is 100% free for you to access. However, a paywall will be going up over the next 30 days for premium data points. So if you want to look at the data before the paywall goes up, go to www.reventure.app now and create an account for free.